Isn't Elizabeth? Be Never mind. Thank you. All right. Well, welcome everybody to the first creative special interest group or shared spe special interest group for 2024. Uh, a big welcome back to Norman. As you most of you know, he was away in Japan for three weeks uh, in November. Five weeks. Five weeks. Oh, my goodness. Yep. We are very fortunate tonight to have artist Edward Peck as our presenter. Um, so I'll speak about him in a moment, introduce him in a moment. As usual, the second half will be our chance to show the results of any creative photography projects and creative challenge uh, for November, December that you've been working on. The creative challenge was um, color theory for photographers. All levels and styles are welcomed. Maximum of eight images, please. For those who have not sent their images to Norman or I, you please have your images ready to go using sh share screen. Um, and then as usual, end, we'll end the evening with the creative challenge for January. I should also mention that I injured my back um, and so what seems to work best for me is to alternate between standing and sitting. So if you see me standing once in a while, <clears throat> I'm just taking a little bit of a break. Okay, I would now um, like to introduce Edward. Edward has studied photography, fine arts, conceptual art, historical techniques, film, and literature at the University of British Columbia. He is currently working with experimental digital imagery and historical photography techniques. He has taught the art of photography for several years at the Shadbolt Center for the Arts in Burnaby. Edward exhibits locally and internationally. He also edited and produced anthologies of Canadian literature and was the assistant editor of the Canadian Fiction Magazine. <clears throat> Recently, Edward and Phyllis Schwartz were artists in residence at the Wallace Stegner, is it? House Stegner, in, yeah, Stegner. Wallace Stegner. And house in East End, Saskatchewan, which led them, which led to their most recent exhibition at the Exchanges Gallery. He is currently a member of the Agora's Experimental Photography, an international collective that will participate in the Barcelona Experimental Photography Festival. Wow, that sounds interesting. <laughs> Edward is also a member of the Matrosen Art Pod, where with Phyllis, they have conducted workshops on alternate photographic processes. Edward's presentation tonight will be entitled Painting with Light. He will describe his process of image creation and then take us through his walking practice. His focus on flashes of perception, sketching with his camera and post-processing software. So before I pass things over to Edward, just a couple of points. Edward has asked that we record the presentation. So that's obviously being done as we've all noted. Uh, and the recording will be uploaded to the Victoria Camera Club YouTube channel tomorrow, probably, or the next day. Thank you, Norman, for that. Um, and I think it seems to work best for the bandwidth if everybody could now click their stop video. Um, so. We, um, I think it, I don't really know, but that's what I've been told. Um, also, uh, I will now mute you all. And Edward, you, would you please unmute yourself and then I'll pass it over to you. Just give me a sec here. Okay. Go ahead, Edward, whenever you're ready. So um, the way I approach photography these days, um, no longer having a dark room and realizing that it's a completely new medium in a way with digital, I see it more more painterly process than a kind of a, a chemical one. So I've been playing around with those ideas. <clears throat> um, the image you're looking at right now is probably about four photographs all stitched together. Um, yeah. And part of a series to do with um, the, the title, um, the title Rivers. 
Uh, a little background on myself. My mother was uh, trained by the Group of Seven, so, and she's an abstract artist. And um, so I've sort of been around art all my life. And um, I started off by doing an awful lot of um, historical techniques um, and everything from uh, egg tempera on up or in the other direction as well. Got uh, got hooked on etching for a number of years, but that's a difficult thing to maintain because you need to have a studio and a lot of equipment. So I sort of passed on that. I spent some time in the can lit uh, field, uh, which was a lot of fun. Um, then I got into a lot of watercolor and pen and ink, which uh, for a number of years. But the whole time I was doing this, I was doing photography. It seemed to be always in the background. Um, I then got into uh, psychotherapy, um, did a lot of uh, research there, and uh, now I'm uh, experimenting. The last 20 years, I'd say, I've been experimenting around with digital printing. Maybe the out there in the 20 point is very primitive, but <laughs> in the last 10 or 5 years, things have certainly accelerated. Edward, before you move on, can I just ask you about that comment about psychotherapy? Uh, mm -hmm. your connection you found between creativity and treating uh, PTSD. Could you say a little bit about that? Um, well, I guess there's two things. Uh, during my during my um, studies, I spent a great deal of time studying creativity. And um, I'm not sure how it's related to PST, PSTD, but I think it um, there's something about photographing that's therapeutic um and i've been reading a number of articles recently about it and um yeah and the the the, the post-traumatic stress disorder that we were working on was basically with war vets we were doing research on how to help them um rewrite some of those uh things that were causing the trauma mm. yeah is that uh that's great thank you yeah so the first thing I wanted to talk about is that I tend to work in series. Um, so if you were to look at my um, Lightroom, uh, you would see an awful lot of categories where I'm sort of collecting different things. So it tends to be usually two or three that I'm focusing on, but there's probably about 10 or 12 that are on the go at the moment. So it's a matter of gathering ideas and images and seeing how they work together. And sometimes things just sort of take off on you when you're focusing on one thing. So uh, one of the series I worked on is this one called the Arrangement Series. Um, this was created, uh, these are all scanographs. Um, they're printed on a dye sublimation. Um, for those of you who might not know what that is, it's... Um, a process of adding a uh, surface to a piece of metal and rather than gluing an image to it the image is sucked into the substrate in a furnace so you get a certain amount of light passing through the substrate onto the image and back again so you get a tiny bit of a kind of a light box effect from it uh, wow. this series was about um uh spent bouquets basically Wow, so beautifully composed that one too. Yeah, uh, and and how sometimes the things we we head to the trash bin with are actually starting to produce some beautiful uh, things that weren't present when they were uh, newer. Mm. And perhaps a comment on <laughs> a youth-oriented society, maybe I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was one series. This series was about industrial abstraction. Um, so one of the things that I found myself doing in my derives was wandering through construction sites and finding all kinds of interesting um, colors and objects and and really having a, a great time. So I, I did. Um, uh, one person told me that they thought I was finding such beauty in the mundane practical elements in the world. So I thought that was kind of a nice <laughs> comment. <laughs> And is this, um, was there much uh, post-processing on that or is that closer um, to what like? Yeah, so that's a good point. Um, I tend to, my philosophy on this is the camera is creating a fiction. 
it's not really real it's not really accurate um so it's much more important to me to try to create um the feeling or the emotion that i was feeling when i took the picture mm. so that's what i'm trying to convey i'm not so concerned about accuracy because the camera is not accurate mm -hmm. but i'm not adding colors i'm just uh, i'm doing it more in a painterly way i'll turn down colors that are clashing turn up colors that are tonally not in sync that sort of thing right yeah and this is a series about how um, when, I, when I'm on my derives and walking around, in my mind, I'm constantly thinking of things in the past, and it's mixing with the things that I'm seeing, and that sometimes the motivation for taking images might be a uh, juxtaposition of something that I'm thinking about. Uh, in this case, um, uh, I had taken a photograph of this beautiful, tranquil um, post um, snowstorm and it was dead quiet. And I thought, wow, that is such a dramatic difference from when I was walking in New York. So I, I tried to say, I thought, okay, there, there I have it. So I need to put those two images together to kind of express that mm. feeling that even though you're present, you're also present with your memories at the same time. So that's what this series is about. Wow. It's a really a very common experience, but you've captured it so well. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> now, this is that I call this inner journey. It's basically a conversation, analog digital conversation. So some of the experimental stuff we were doing for Barcelona, uh, I was doing chemigrams and cyanotypes. And um, then I thought, you know, why not? I mean, I'm going to have to print them. I'm going to wind up digitizing them anyway. So let's see what we can do if we can digitize and manipulate what can happen there. So that's kind of what this is, what this thing is about, is creating abstract compositions uh, from analog sources in a digital way. Mm -hmm. um, this was a series of uh, the title. This is part of that title. Um, <coughs> uh series and it just seemed that it made more sense to do it in black and white so the the whole series is mostly in black and white this is the fraser river is that where the, this is or yeah so there's about 40 miles of tidal river now maybe the the boat owners here knows probably what happened here and that is that he uh, decided to tie the boat to the shore i think um and not realizing it was tidal and then when the tide came in and he wasn't there the water just rushed right into the uh the, the tide went out the boat went over the tide came in and filled the boat with water mm. but the uh, the thing about the fraser river i thought is that you know it reminds me of uh, joseph conrad's heart of darkness you know that sometimes you have to go out to the extent of the empire or the extent of the uh, the city to see the actual reality of what the city is causing. Yeah. So that's kind of what this ser series was about. It's a perspective none of us get to see, I think, mostly. Most mm -hmm. people, anyway. Yeah. Wow. Um, this was a series, um, mm -hmm. a very short series. I found this wall, and um, I'm trying to, I can't remember what, what it's called, but it's when the uh, concrete starts to uh, react with water and you get these wonderful abstract kind of compositions so I just happened to be walking and spotted it and I thought ah I wonder what I could do with this so I came back with my equipment a little bit later and started work I came back a few times actually different times a day different lights trying to figure out how to capture it and this might be probably more processed than most things that i do i think it's very highly processed it's very powerful yeah thank you yeah uh this is a shelter island series um uh, when my father was dying and i was coming home from visiting him uh, i needed sort of uh sort of come down off that and i started walking in the shipyard and i happened to notice that 
everything that was happening below the waterline as the ships were pulled out was really super interesting. There was lots of colors. There was lots of other things going on. So I next time I came back with my camera and my equipment and uh, started photographing it, I probably spent about 10 or 15 goes at this, uh, working on a series um, right in the shipyard. So you would go back 10 to 15 times to the same area? Yeah. Well, once, what, like uh, with my derives, if I, I find something and I know something's there, or even though when I go home, it's not in my camera, I, I don't quit because mm. I know there's something there. I just have to get it at the right time or I have to be in the right kind of state of mind to see things. But you, you sense that there's a, there's some jewel there kind of thing. That's right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Instincts are driving me. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a series that I haven't finished. Um, and I'm, I think I'm the working title right now is Every Breath We Take. And it's about basically trees. Huh, it's interesting you say that because I remember seeing this at the Souk Art Show. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's just very uh, captivating. And it's still yeah. not finished, you're saying. Um, well, the series isn't. This one... Um, <laughs> I had come back to this this spot, I think, about eight or nine times because I just knew that there was, you know, something there um, about that tree and the way it sort of hung over the water and the moss. And I just happened to come back when the fog was rolling off the, the lake. And I thought, oh, that's it. So I managed to get this one. Um, walking practice. So this is a bit about how, how I go about things. And it just reminds me of, um, I think it's it Yeats who said, if you want to write a good poem, you have to find the objective correlative. And I think that's what Claire is talking about here, that um, sometimes there's something about a certain place and the way it is that uh, kind of says more than just what it says more, basically. Mm. So um, let's see, I usually walk for at least an hour because it takes a while to kind of get into zone. Mm -hmm. And um, I use flashes of perception to help me lo locate not just compositions, but also ideas. So in other words, I might get an idea for a different series just by seeing something. And maybe that's not the thing I photograph, but it, uh, it, it, it gives me a, a way, a direction. And one important element is that is to use my camera to sketch. Now, I think that's my use of sketch may confuse people, Kevin. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, you, you need to say a bit more for me. And yeah. Mike. So how did you understand me when I was uh, we were going through that before? <laughs> um, so sketches to me, it's something you do with a pencil on paper. Right. And you're saying... So the purpose why you would do a sketch on paper is perhaps the same purpose you would be using your camera um, to kind of do an initial recording or a, right. a capture something initially. Yeah. And then um, you, you, you would spend more time trying to look at it from different angles and things. Mm-hmm. Um, so the other, the other element, and we'll get back to the sketching in a minute, because I think it comes out a little <laughs> further on. The other thing that's important here is, and a lot of people probably know about this book called Flow. Uh, I did study this a great deal and probably read most of Chick, Chick Sen Mahaili's books and even had some correspondence with him. But basically, uh, what he's, 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 um, Riffing off of Maslow, basically, um, at peak experiences and exploring it further with people that are doing creative things. And he's saying that you, that you, that you can get yourself into a state of flow where the challenge and your skill set are well balanced. And what that does is um, it gets you into a, a, state, a, a state where time falls away where the task takes over and you're not sure that you're you or the task is actually moving you forward. Um, now, the problem with that, of course, is entropy. 
Um, and I guess the definition of that is the death of self, of expression, of creativity. This is uh, his definition of it. Um, and you have to overcome that entropy. And basically what I, the way I interpret that is that you have preconceived notions of what you're seeing and you're not, often not seeing what's in front of you and you have to sort of overcome that. Wow. And that's a little hard to do. So hang on, could you go back yeah. to that one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I read one of his books, The Finding Flow. Yeah. And so I'm not sure if people are getting the the um, diagram on the right there. I mean, it took me a while to get it, but it's, so as your skill level is, is low, and you yep. have you have something that's not very challenging. You're kind of apathy. You know, you're kind of or or I guess. So, so what will happen is that um, the way I would interpret photography is that the first the first ticky box is you get into the technical elements of your camera. Yeah. You go for control. Yeah. Um, after that, you think, oh, there's not much worth looking at or trying to take pictures of here, right? Mm -hmm. And if your skills are low and you're but you're seeing something uh, that you really want to take a picture of, you, then there's an arousal state and anxiety and worry. And then you drop off that flow state as a result of worrying because your skill set's not where it should be. Right. Yeah. Are you yeah, getting that? Of that? The control was a good a good analogy. That's where you get into with my F stop right or you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And you can get into that place where you're challenged, but not too much. And, yeah. and that's kind of where the flow happens at your skill level and your challenge is kind of at the that sweet spot. Yeah. 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 And that I think that says a lot about building. And I'm sure most people have got a really good skill set in your group. But it says a lot about how you need to experiment with your camera and run tests and whatnot to get that all out of the way so that when you go out there and actually do the shooting, you're not thinking about those things right yes um overcoming entropy so this is how i do it i guess um not always perfectly and sometimes i go out and come back with nothing and no flow state <laughs> but the camera has to be kind of a sketching thing where i'm just where i'm not critical about what i'm taking um the camera ha i set up well before i go out or well act actually just as I step out of the car or out of my front door so that I know that it's mostly set to the the atmosphere that I'm going to be in and the light. And um, I start to walk, basically. Um, and in that walking, I find that the sooner I get my camera out and take a photo of something, even if it's not the right thing to be taking a photo of, that's uh, how I begin to actually get into that state. So um, occasionally the first two or three shots uh, that I've been instinctively driven to take sometimes are good. And other times it's, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 shots in when it starts to click. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not, you know, it's digital. I don't have to worry. I can delete them. Um, but as I'm moving, it's getting me kind of, connected i'm starting to move towards that flow state does that make sense uh kevin mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah um so this is about the blow-up syndrome uh, for those of you who've seen the movie the i think it's antonio only is it no something something like that anyway it's a photographer who takes a picture in um hyde park maybe and uh, he goes back to the dark room and discovers there's a dead body lying in the bushes which he never saw when he took the picture so it's kind of a metaphor for how the pro one of the problems with photographing, and um, I guess to put it this way is there could be say 130 megapixels of vision in your eyes, um, way more than a camera has. Um, yet when you bring the camera home, it's seen more than you've actually seen. So why is that? Yeah. Well, the reason of that is that is that, that there's like maybe six megapixels of color information that you're actually focused on. And the rest of the information you're seeing is a virtual reality based on something you've just seen, seen a little while ago or seen three, four or five, 10 days ago. So it's kind of that syndrome when you're driving somewhere in a building you use a navigate disappears. 
And all for a moment, you don't know where you are. Mm -hmm. Because most of the time you've been focusing on that building as a wayfinding item, and you haven't been actually seeing those other things. So what we're focusing on is a critical piece. Is that what you're saying? What What's happening is that you're focusing on what your peripheral vision is often, like when I'm walking, your peripheral vision is looking for danger. Mm -hmm. So, or something unusual, uh, it's your survival instinct. So your focus points are often being driven by this peripheral vision. So it occur occurred to me that you could train that over time to look for unique and interesting compositions. Because if you follow those instinctive, like, wait a second, there's something uh, over here and don't just ignore it, yeah. uh, but to actually take your focus there. I, I think that's a way of finding interesting compositions. Is that Kevin? Yeah, it's really, really good. But the, what you're describing, I think, is a very um, the word, strong or deep level of commitment to this um, trusting that intuition or that you know, what you're you're sensing. You know, the tendency, I think, is for me. I'm since looking at your slides, I've gone out shooting once, and I've noticed that I take a few shots, you know, and then I want to move on. Part of me just wants to kind of move on. Right. And I think what you're implying here is to stop and and uh, uh, take a little more time, and um, yeah, that's what he would call succumbing to the entropy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, and the other thing about this is that you cannot possibly get all the information from your eyes without over <laughs> over. Um, flooding your your brain so the information you're actually getting is very minimal mm -hmm. uh, from what the eye actually is seeing so there's that kind of bottleneck as well going on right. um yeah so that the first one is explaining the uh the, your sort of virtual reality thing that goes on um and yes detecting the unusual you're focusing to it the flashes of perception can be harnessed so i've just pretty much covered this one i think <laughs> and this is another image from that um uh, memory uh, series right yeah um so how i respond to those flashes is i slow down i scan with my viewfinder i begin framing because i think that that's the difference between painting and cameras is that the that you can move things around in a painting if you don't like them in the right place but with a camera it's a framing exercise so the more i move the frame around the more i see the potential of what's what uh, my flashes of perception have driven me to look at mm. and i and then i watch the elements within the frame you know the closest the furthest away how they interact when i move around I might even do what I call a 180 or a 360 process. If it's a really, a really like I really is something here, I might actually walk around in a circle and and sort of take it from all kinds of different angles. Hmm. And if I do find something where there's some interesting, I come back, like I was saying, over and over again, different seasons, different lights, different atmospheric conditions, trying to see. Um, and I can remember talking to a photographer about this, and he said he'd been on the islands off of the east coast of uh, the United States for about a week. And um, he was walking like I would walk uh, over and over three or four days. And then one day he saw this cloud formation and a certain kind of light appear in the sky. And he went, ah, I know just where I have to take this picture. And he said he ran as fast as he could back to this particular spot that he'd seen earlier mm. and then frame that foreground in with the background. He just, it, like it just appeared in his head, that picture. Wow. So it's that kind of a thing. Wow. Um, now the painterly process. Um, my images uh, are an artistic representation of my emotional experience of a place. It's not a document of a scene or not a document of an object. And my, my process, I think, has some parallels to the painterly tradition. And I'm going to show you kind of what maybe a lot of people are familiar with this. But um, this is a Hughes um, sketch. 
Um, so I don't know how well people can see this in their computer, but there's there's lines and diagrams, and he's saying that uh, this color has to go here, this has to go darker, there's a certain green that has to go there. So he's actually trying to think of how to do the colors in the image. And that's one thing that happens with me is I, I often turn my camera up to a, a vivid so that I can see the colors that are there because I want to know which colors I want to use and not use in the camera when I go back and I need to kind of remember it. Interesting. So that helps me. So that's kind of what he's doing there. Um, and then there's the resulting painting. I still don't know where that is. <laughs> I'm sure someone <laughs> recognizes it. Um, and um, so this is something perhaps Monet did as well. You're probably very familiar with the haystacks, how he set up six canvases and and start started painting the haystacks in different light to try to figure out how the light and the color changed during the uh, you know the golden hour and things like that. Um, so my my processing, I usually, I most things come in first with Lightroom. Sometimes I find that I have to move it into Capture One to get the colors to come out correctly because I'm using uh, a mostly a Fuji cameras right now, and that tends to process the Fuji cameras a little bit better in RAW. Uh, not always. Um, sometimes, occasionally, I get into Nick, which is a lot of fun, um, and. Um, and then the, the other point I'd like to make here is that, that I guess when you print, that's a whole other world as well. Um, because I mean, a backlit screen is not the same thing as a, a print on the wall. And so there again, there's a whole process of, process of experimentation. When I did the series on um, arrangements, I um, spent a lot of time printing it on papers. Um, I printed some of it on um, back mounts. Uh, I printed some of it um, in, in various forms and finally settled on the die sublimation. So, you know, printing a series is often a matter of trying to think about what printing process is going to work best with it. Um, and this is just to say that the world of photography has changed dramatically. Um, the most interesting thing I find is that it's very close to the materials that you use for etchings and lithographs. I'm printing on a hot press bright paper, which I would have used with my etchings. Um, I'm using pigment inks, which is what I would have used with my etchings. Um, so, and you're really using pigments. Uh, you're using cyan and uh, magentas and... Uh, so that's a whole different, totally different thing from being in a chemical dark room. Your possibilities are far more vast. Your potential for experimentation is far greater. Um, and uh, you can, if you like, completely leave reality in terms of representational photographs and come up with some very interesting things. I'm sure a lot of you are probably in that zone. Yeah. Um, sketching. Um, so this is just an illustration of, um, how, how I would sketch. This was during the, um, the artist, um, retreat that we had in East End. Edward, uh, could I just stop you for a moment? Yep. Um, we have a, a few things in chat. So I think what we'll do is take questions at the end. Uh, Unless it's a have pertinent questions. one that someone fits in here, I guess. Yeah. Um, they just, they're saying that they just want to, oh, one sec here. Very interested in learning more about the dye sublimation service and it is available and its relative cost. There is a, there, it's, <clears throat> it's cheaper than framing with glass and you can get larger. So your, your price point is much lower. Uh, but uh, a lot of the local people that might do it, say London Drugs, um, are not really using the best substrates and the best aluminum. Uh, the there's a fellow in White Rock who is doing it for the Pacific Northwest, and uh, he uses very high quality substrates and aluminum. 
and I can send Kevin that information if people are interested. Great, perfect. Uh, so this was a this was one of these places where I mean I I I just loved this shed home uh, that had been repurposed. The the uh, the truck and the the bales of hay and the snow and I I kept coming back and and um, so this is a good example of sketching both with the camera and with the computer. So you'll see that I'm moving around doing different forms of processing, you know, um, trying to reduce the color to see what happens, um, trying to change angles, um, different forms of it. And, um, eventually come up with something so that's a, that's an example of um sketching both with the camera and with your photo processing programs it looks like the bales of hay are, are not present in some of them was that your uh did you do that on purpose or is no uh well, that happened <laughs> uh, i was a little, a little um, um put out that the bales of hay disappeared <laughs> but um yeah, still. I mean, I mean, that's probably why I moved to this angle, I think. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and this is just an example of a rich location that I've come gone back to um, probably 50 times. Um, yeah, not the picture on the right. You'll recognize that probably um, as Francis King. Um, and... Mm -hmm. This is a process that, um, yeah, this this process of derive and and walking, I, I I probably should say a bit about that. Yeah, um, it it's something that Baudelaire came up with, and a lot of writers use it. Virginia Woolf, for example, when she was writing um, Mrs. Dalloway, and she would get stuck, she would get up and she would walk the streets, and then from walking the streets the experience that she had would then get back into the novel that she was writing so she was using the environment to stimulate her creativity mm -hmm. um i think robert frank likely worked in the same way um martha cooper is a very interesting example of um someone who found something that just she couldn't let go and then she just kept at it for years and uh it 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 made her very famous so she's basically i think if i remember correctly she's the uh the maven of uh, graffiti uh, photographers if any i'm sure people are familiar with her work mm -hmm. and i think fred herzog probably worked the same way mm -hmm. so um these are just scenes from the same area this was an interesting one uh, probably this is five or six photos but um i'd gone through this probably umpteen dozen times and then I just all of a sudden the light was right and you know yeah it, you said that you um if you could go back one um, is this the one that you said that this was several pictures uh with a 50 millimeter that yeah, stitched together because you yeah. you get better proportions that way or like. Oh yeah, uh, so um, I think I and th maybe this is to say something about experimentation. Um, I I, ha I was in down in an industrial area and I had my I had my twenty twenty four and my thirty five and my fifty and my fifty six with me, actually my seventy five with me because I only shoot in primes now. And um, I thought, I wonder what the difference is between the Im these images if I create stitched images. So I stood in one place and I shot it with all those lenses and then went home and stitched them all together and took a look at what the effect was. And um, I'm sure that people will have different thoughts about what looks good because it's a personal opinion. Mm -hmm. But my sense was my 35 and my 50 were doing the most interesting um so i tend to use the 50 in most cases unless it's somewhere where i just need a little more reach and then I'll, i might use the 35 when i'm doing panos mm -hmm. yeah 
Good but question. I like the 50 because the distortion is not um, as problematic. Right. Thank you. So basically, my process is, uh, you know, trying to get into flow, not not um, ignoring those flashes of perceptions and 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 working them um, and letting them direct where I go, mm -hmm. um, and making sure that I sketch with my camera and not worry about whether it's a good shot or a bad shot. Just keep, you know, shooting. Um, returning to rich sites over and over again at different times and sketching with the raw processing to create, you know, to try and recreate those emotional experiences I was having when I took the photo. Mm. The end. <laughs> All right. So beautiful. Wow. Thank you. You expressed it. You expressed it so clearly. Oh, thank you. Any comments or questions uh, for Edward? Incredibly, yeah. Somebody's saying thank you. Incredibly beautiful images. Yeah, thank you. Do you print a lot of them yourself? Like, um, um I have um, a series of frames in my home. And um, when I'm working on a series, I'll print a lot of them and hang them up on the walls so that I can look at them and think about where the series is going. Because I know that the print is not going to look anything like what I'm seeing on my screen. Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. Nice. That sounds like a very good way to do it. Because you do, you tend to look at them more as if they're on the wall. So, yeah. I'm sure pe there's people who, who will do that. I mean, I go down to Opus and th there's some, I think their Cypress frames are pretty easy. They're all intact and you can play around with those and it, it they look fairly formal and you can see whether it's going to work or not. Yeah. Somebody's asked, uh, can you explain some of the techniques you use in post to create a painterly image? Yeah, it kind of depends on the image. So um, I may work the same image jumping dozen times um, and then restart and delete it. Um, but I tend to... Um, look at the color and you have to take it you do there's a color theory person coming on so that i that's one of the things i look at first is um when you're painting you've got to make sure that the uh, colors you're choosing are not going to clash so um so that's the first thing i'll look at is is there colors in the images that are just not working um and uh is the tonal values of the colors off or do they need to be balanced better that's that's one thing that i will do Mm -hmm. um not quite sure if that answers the question or not um let me see here no, i'm not sure either did that answer your question but oh, i'm not saying follow up. Hmm? go ahead um it was in the last eight or so photos oh i see yeah that's a follow-up to something else. Sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. Um, I lost my train there. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. You you mentioned you use uh, Nick. Yeah. As part of your software packages, is any one of the uh, program you use more than others? Uh, Obviously yeah. You use the Silver FX. Yep. Silver FX and Color FX Pro mm. are the two that I tend to be in. Yeah. Because I find you can, you can, you can, oh, what's a good analogy? It's like blues guitar. You can bend some notes much further in Nick than you can in Lightroom. Does that make sense? <laughs> yep, totally. Yeah. And maybe, maybe um, sometimes the image just doesn't lend itself to that. And other times it does. Yeah. Somebody has asked uh, to see that image. Um, I, I just, I'll share my screen. I'll pull it. I've just pulled it up and I'll okay. share my screen. 
Do you see that one there? Nope. Nope. There. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody's asked about that. Could you say more about that one? Um, that one, um, I think I was really taken by the inky darkness of the um, water, but when I got it in camera, the camera had averaged it so badly that the inkiness had gone away. Mm. So I really had to manipulate it to get it to come back to the way I kind of felt the, the like the feel of it. That's mm -hmm. the brightness of the leaves and the darkness of the water. So I probably added a lot of black in here. Um, and I probably did a lot of work to try to accent the, the, um, the, the color of the leaves to get that feeling back. Right. That would have been a lot of detail work. A lot of time. Yeah. 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 Now, with the new tools that are in Capture One and in Lightroom, um, I have been playing around an awful lot more with um, the masks than I had before, uh, which is extremely interesting. And um, especially when you've got like a high dynamic range going on in your image and you can actually isolate the sky and bring it back into um, into a better tonal representation of what actually happened there uh, and manipulate the foreground as well in the same way. Does that, that make sense? Yeah. Is there an image you're thinking of that you showed us tonight? That would be a uh, of that? Let's see. Um, I've got your slide. No. I actually don't think there is. Wow. Um, maybe it could be the tree one down in 40 could be a bit of one. This one? I, I'm sorry, I don't have a good example in there, but yeah, because there was such a, such a, a contrast here. I mean, that, that it was pretty much black, the tree. Mm -hmm. So trying to isolate stuff, but it was very hard to do with this one. So not a great example of it. Um, <clears throat> hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question for Edward, if I can, yeah, yep. go ahead, if I can put it in terms that will make sense. Edward, you were talking about the movie Blow Up. I, I yeah. recall that movie. And, and what happened in the movie, as you mentioned, the photographer was taking a picture in a park, didn't notice a dead body, and only saw it later mm -hmm. when he went back, processed the film, and blew the image up, and he and he saw it. M my question to you is, and, and you, also, you also said, we only pay attention to a small percentage of what's in front of our eyes. The rest of it is peripheral vision and a ton of data is going to the brain, but we don't pay any attention to, to it unless there's something to alert us. Right. So, so my question is, you you will use uh, uh, you'll do panoramas using composites, maybe fifty millimeter, whatever. Do you do you go do you meticulously go through every part of every image you're putting together? It, 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 the way the photographer did and blow up and found the body. Do you go through and look with your fovea to look at the detail of every part, or are you looking more at the big peripheral vision? Yeah, I tend to be kind of a gestalt kind of guy, <laughs> but there, but there are images where I do exactly that. That I know there's something there, and um, the gestalt form of processing is not working so that then i will do what you're what you're suggesting because mm. mm. I, I know that i know i've got something on that image and i just it just needs to be more more processing needs to happen mm -hmm. mm. great question makes sense james yep yeah uh, another question here in uh, the chat the painting that you did not know the location of was Revelstoke, north of downtown. Yeah. And the courthouse in the lower left. Yeah, I suspected it might be, but I wasn't sure. Thank you. This photo is looking west towards Eagle Pass. <laughs> yeah, and I think Hughes was interesting. Thank he you. basically got into his car 
and drove those highways. And I and I, someone correct me if I am wrong, but he would then something would just jump out at him and he would stop and then he'd be there for hours. Hmm. And so one of the things about being a painter, I think, is that you are staring at this scene for a long, long time. So you are actually erasing a lot of the um, virtual reality stuff by focusing so much on the scene. And that's why I think that with a camera, you've got to spend more time. Once that you get, oh, there's something here, you've got to spend a lot of time and a lot of shots just trying to work it. Mm. Like EJ Hughes would do with his pad of paper. Yeah. Mm. Great. Any other questions um, for Edward before we thank him? All right, uh, it's been a very rich uh, presentation. Uh, lots, a lot of food for thought. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs>